You're listening to Lender Lounge with Kevin Kim, a podcast dedicated to the private lending industry. I'm Kevin Kim, and my goal is to sit down with key figures in the private lending industry to talk about their business and their personal lives. We'll get their takes on market conditions, the industry at large, and their personal stories. Overall, I really want to learn more about how they started and grew their businesses. So whether you're a lender, a borrower, a vendor, an investor, or anyone just interested in learning more about private lending, this podcast is definitely for you. Thanks for tuning in and enjoy this week's episode of Lender Lounge with Kevin Kim. All right, guys, welcome to another episode of Lender Lounge with Kevin Kim. Uh, today, we are lucky enough to have the CEO of Civic and our friend Whit from Civic, head of correspondent lending. And you guys drove all the way down from Redondo Beach. We did. Thank you very much for coming down Absolutely. to our offices here in Irvine. Thank you. Beautiful. Uh, and really appreciate you guys joining us on the show. Um, so, before we get into it, you know, briefly introduce yourselves to the audience for those of you, for those who don't know you guys already, sure. and uh, we'll get into it. Yeah. Whit? Yeah. Uh, Whit McCarthy, uh, Senior Vice President of the Correspondent Lending Division at Civic. Uh, was fortunate enough to be one of the original few at the organization, so I've been able to see it from where we started to, to where it is today. So uh, very, very fortunate to be in that position awesome. to be able to see it all the way through the, uh, through the last seven today, right? years. Mm-hmm. Seven yeah. this month, right? Seven this month. Seven year anniversary. It yep. is. Here's yourself. Uh, Bill Tesser, a President CEO of Civic, uh, been in the lending space about thirty, a little over 35 years, been with Civic going on five. Um, Civic's in a really, really interesting point in its in, since its inception right. today. And um, we're excited about really our capital base and what tomorrow looks like. Right. So glad to be here. And, and Civic is a, just for our audience who aren't, you know, deeply entrenched in, this, in the private lending space, Civic is a retail and wholesale private lender. Correct. Correspondent as well. Yep. Correspondent as yeah. well. <laughs> yep. And you guys have been really, you guys only do private lending. We're not talking about anything else, right? Yeah, right. I think that's important, right? That when So when I made my transition over from the convention, I was 30 years on the conventional side. I think everyone believed I was going to come over here and, and do the BPL stuff yeah. and then bring some conventional. Sure. That was never the intent. Okay. Like after three decades, it was good for me to yeah. make a transition. And that space has kind of got, it's, it's kind of in its own groove. It's, it's pretty much set in stone now, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, I just done. don't think, I think um, there's there's a couple tech plays from the big and the mighty, like the Lone Depots of the world, and, and, and they're still moving that ball forward. I think for the masses, it's at the tail end of that life cycle, meaning it's, it's there's a lot of autopilot that goes on in most of the transactions that take place there. The government is your partner, margins are paper thin, uh, competition, uh, highest it's ever been. And so I think the way that I thought about it is the opportunities in this space, it's really more in the embryonic stage. Right. And it's just Especially wide open. when you joined five years ago. I mean, uh, Very much so. Yeah. yeah. So, so let's go over the core products for Civic just to make sure our audience is, is, is aware. Because we have some listeners who are new to the space, who are, aren't even in the space. They're builders. They're just enthusiasts. They're investors. So give us kind of the, the 30,000 intro of, of Civic's core product line and what you guys do, and we'll go from there. Sure. So... Our, our bread and butter historically has been the bridge product, right? One and two year loans, uh, interest That's only programs, only, right? single family, one to four, you know, condos, townhomes and whatnot, but residential in nature. Uh, that's been our, our sweet spot, the fix and flip value add rehab. So, you know, up to 80% LTV acquisition, 100% rehab, 75 ARV, kind of the standard fix and flip product. You know, we just think we do a very good job at yep. that with um, compared to others in the space. And so- that's what we've done historically since day one. Uh, we rolled out a rental product about two and a half years ago now that is becoming, I think, by this last month, it actually surpassed 50% of our total originations by units, um, which is the first time that's happened. But it's been a, a very, very strong product. Uh, 30-year programs, uh, 5 one, seven, one or 10 one arms, really just stabilized DSCR rental products. So you're, you're hyper-focused then, because a lot of your competitors, even on the correspondence side, will do like... What I would consider commercial real estate, you know, uh, they'll do have big multifamily, they'll do mixed use, they'll do other things. They will only do, or some others will say, we'll do all types of residential. Like, sure. You name it, right? Yeah. And, so we also do have a multifamily lending division as well. Up uh, to 100 doors, up to 100. I think it's technically 150 today. That's so, still pretty small compared to like a lot of these guys are targeting the big, big mixed use projects yeah. still. And so it's kind of interesting. Yeah. So. And so we're definitely value add bridge on that. It's up to 80 LTC and, and, 
I think, low cost and, and uh, strong programs for any value add investor for multifamily product. And then, you know, what I've focused on and specialized in is, is working with other lenders as a capital provider, right? right? Being able and to give them capital. program, right? And that's exactly. evolved over the years, over the past seven years now. You guys are offering all types of programs for people, originators can work with you directly. You can fund their deals. You can, I think you can buy their deals too, if they wanted to. We're not buying closed loans today, but that's in the product development roadmap for uh, correspondent in the future. And, yeah. and all within, you know, seven, ye- seven years, seven years. And I want to know also like size, because... I know the numbers. I mean, but I want you guys to say because sure. it's important that you guys say. You know, you guys. I mean, when you guys first started back seven years ago, I think, you know, you were a new market entry, and seven years later, now we're talking in the billions now. Mm-hmm. I mean, is this per year? I mean, I, I yeah. saw an ad recently, or um, a Facebook or a LinkedIn post. Billion, oh, two billion in origination. Is that is that total now? Or no, no. We say we we passed five. We'll pass six this wait, year. Wait, wait, wait. Five billion over seven years. Mm-hmm. Yeah, fantastic. yeah. Actually, it took us. What did we say? The first five years, first four years to do the first billion, and then we did four billion in the next three. I think we'll pass six billion this year. One point seven for the year. So build out the host horsepower there. <laughs> well, yeah, you I can mean, say that. Yeah, yeah, a little bit of that. But then you know, listen, like. I think what gets lost, and, and I'm glad that Wit brings it up, what they did in the beginning um, to get Civic started, yeah. they didn't know a whole lot about lending when they started. It was really off the backs of Wedgwood being the largest fix and right. flipper in, in the space right. and Jim uh, Helfrich and Gary McCarthy mm-hmm. running HMC assets that they said, hey, we're in the middle of all these transactions. We should do loans. Right. They started on the conventional side. They realized that's a very tough gig. Our company- Skyline bought them, and then uh, they pivoted and started Civic on the private money, and it was really um, Wit and Jack and, and a handful of others. I remember that deal one, like, hey, we funded a loan, we funded our first million, funded our five, and and really, I got to watch kind of closely, but afar, watch what they did. Were and you involved in the company? Somewhere? I was involved only, not in that company, only uh, with Wedgwood because Wedgwood, when we bought their mortgage company, they invested in Skyline, so I'd have to report back and. And Gary McCarthy, one of the founders, which is also Witt's father, and I would meet every quarter to discuss how Family Skyline was doing. That's awesome. Originally, yeah. yeah really cool, yeah. actually. Yeah. A bunch of different silos within the greater Wedgwood organization. But still, I mean, you've been very rare to see. You don't see a lot of family, like, you know, father and son. Grand, you don't see a lot of, like, generational involvement in the industry. It's one thing you think you see more of, but we don't see a lot. I of think, yeah, it's hard. I mean... Can you have generations when this, I think, industry is still so in its infancy? Kind of. I mean, yeah. it's kind of, it's starting to now, yeah. right? Like we're, the, like there are folks that, at least we just got back from CMA, right? And there's yeah. some folks who've been doing this for 20, 30 years mm-hmm. when it was a different industry. You yeah. Know? And so like they're, they're pre-institutional. Sons are, yeah. Their sons are kind of involved, but mm-hmm. not really. So it's, we rarely see it. I think I can name companies where fa- like father and son are in the space on my hands. Yeah. So it's very cool to hear. Yeah, it was great. I mean, you know, we didn't work directly with each other being that he oversaw NPL division. We had the, the fix and flip division underneath the Wedgwood banner and then civic um, on its own. Yeah. I think what what Gary did a great job with is provide a lot of capital uh, markets infrastructure oversight. And so that put them in the game to allow to start expanding their wings a bit. And so when we came in in 17, they had had a nice run up and then like most smaller companies, they got, had some capital constraints. And so they had to solve some capital problems. I came in, I think in March of 17, that month they had done like 22 million. I think they had 40 employees, but they had, they had a, they had good 40, like the 40 was solid. Uh, and so I think what we did when we came over, we just, uh, when I say we Merced, I brought Merced Cohen, uh, head of operations with me. We just watched for like 90 days and stayed out of people's way just made sure that we understood when you were brought on you were you were CEO you were appointed CEO at the time yes okay yeah and so you don't really want to get in there and bring a bunch of ideas when you don't understand what is and isn't working and I think what I found in those 90 days what there was there was a lot working and we had a lot of good people and they had a good baseline to build on and then we started bringing people we started bringing tech we started bringing infrastructure, social media push, reputation management, digital platform, the whole thing. And it's really one person and one step at a time. We enhanced pricing. We uh, expanded our, our comp matrix and started bringing a, a little products and then really conquering and dividing. So WIT, which might have had 11 hats, now got to focus on two or three because we were bringing bench strength in. And, and so I think in 17, we did... 
So we came, it was 20 million. In that 17, we did about 600 million. Correct me if I'm wrong on any of these. 20 million a month to, yeah. To 600, 600 million for, yeah. the, for the year. And then 18, we did like 900 million. And 19, we did a billion two. And you go into COVID and the world falls apart. Right. And what was interesting for me was I didn't really know the economics of a lot of the competition. You just look at the marketing and you fill you, in. You the, don't know what's going on behind the scenes. You never know that, right? Right, 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 right? But I think what was really eye-opening for me was how many people stopped lending altogether or just paused. Like it was 75 to 80% of our oh, space. Yeah. I remember the day. It yeah. Was... Uh, well, I remember it too. And so like what we did was like we were very well capitalized, very well capitalized, had a whole bunch of cash. Why don't you put a bunch of cash in to Civic? So we didn't have any line problems and we didn't have any funding problems. So this is all balance of capital. Yeah, well, well, a portion of it. And we had a very big uh, warehouse lines as well. And, and Credit Suisse, which was one of our biggies, didn't have margin calls with us. I mean, we were very well capitalized with them as well. The problem was you had no buyers of the loan. Yeah. So if you're originating new paper, at a price point or a leverage point that there are no buyers, you're 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 basically bankrupting a company. So we we I mean we probably spent two straight weeks around the table trying to figure out where you had to adjust leverage, whack points, oh, yeah. parameters, and and it was a daily thing. I remember the the numbers were changing every day. Like they oh, were. They'll buy at you know they'll buy at what they used to buy, but they want a discount. Or if you want to sell to them, they want the yield to be up by two points. I mean, we we had pretty static rate sheets prior to COVID. I think we had maybe maybe one adjustment a year. That, yeah. Maybe two if we were feeling a little saucy. But when, but when that happened, I mean, yeah. We were adjusting every other day, it felt we, like. I'll tell you what's crazy. So my relationship with Credit Suisse goes all the way to the top. Right. And so I'm having a conversation with them, and I'm saying, they're saying bill. So what what was 103 or 104 on a bid for a piece of paper was now 92, 93. Oh, yeah. And he goes, and at 92, I'm not a buyer. No. I go, well, 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 hold on a second. Same FICO, same, we're not a buyer. At so where, he goes, I, if I were And they you, were 92 for you guys. A that's lot right. of my clients was, who were it, on it, a level, it was 86. That's right. Yeah. Same numbers. That's right. It was crazy. And so, but I wasn't going to sell 92 Absolutely and we didn't not. need to sign. So really what, what we did, which leads into the acquisition was, uh, a, Another bank that bought a lot of paper from us was Pacific Western Bank. They'd bought in over three quarters of a billion. And that relationship with their CEO and Wedgwood CEO goes back 25 years. Yeah. And they also fund. So there's a history there. That's, they fund hundreds of millions of dollars okay. with Wedgwood. And so I didn't what, know you guys were selling to the, I didn't know they were buying loans. I didn't know retail they, banks were buying loans. From well, they're, 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 you know, if you go look at PWB, they're a very, um, they're a very different looking regional bank. They, they, they make a little bit more whack. And their stuff has a little bit more risk on it. So they've been in this space with us for three years. This was nothing new. Now, what they did, what Matt, we didn't sell a lot to them recently because you had the Credit Suisses and the Morgans and the Nomuras coming in and they were paying, you 103, know. 103, 104. Yeah, and yeah. whereas maybe they weren't. Right. And so we had tr transitioned our paper to there over the last year, but they stepped right up. We lent uninterrupted from March of, of 19 right when it March of 20, right when it started all the way through. Now we didn't lend as much. Right. We were like 60, 70 million a month instead of a hundred million right. a month. But I remember I, I got your guys updated matrix in like the mid Aprils, but I, I was, you were the only ones that had yeah, it. And it was, so, you know, I don't know, help me nine and three quarters to 10 and a half and two points. Yeah, and low leverage. At that. I mean, in California, and, uh, we're seeing nine plus, yeah. you know, two points. Uh, but, so we did that. And then what happened is, they got to look. I mean, they got to look at what we were doing yeah, as a company. Too. Of yeah. course, yeah. right? And, and they'd already had access to all our financials and performance. And so talks began to fast track because they have a ton of cash. And right. they want to put the cash to work. And no better way to put the cash to work than right. to deploy it through our machine. Like and any so, other bank, they're suffering on originations. They can't get the deals done on their end. So. And truth be told, without getting into names, we were already way down the road in a potential acquisition with another company, a Wall oh, Street really? firm, way down the road. And the brakes came on because we got to watch how that Wall Street firm reacted to such a thing, sure. which was eye-opening to us, right. you know, a huge firm. And so what this company did is they came in and they paid a premium, they paid all cash, and they closed in whoa, whoa, what was whoa. about six months. Because this happened it, this happened during COVID. Like, it, it, it was announced during COVID, and we were all, like, scratching our heads. Like, there were speculators saying, like, oh, is it a distress play? Is it them? Like, 
I, I'm talking to a client of mine saying, I don't think it's a distress play because they're active. They're, they're not, like of the national shops that are retail and correspondent, like what you guys do, your competitors, they're active, though they're not. There's no reason why they wouldn't, why it would be a distress. It was a significantly greater premium wow. paid than what was on the table, and it was all and cash. And you guys kept control. With no earnings. You're still, you're still in your seat. There's no, uh, nothing well, seems to have changed that much. Well, you know, and that, that I think point. that's the big misnomer. Like some of the things I've heard at conferences, oh, you know, they're owned by a bank. They're bankified. You, now you're going to go to, it's getting a bank loan. It's, right. it's, that's a crock of shit. Right. Like we aren't bankified. We are, we're, we're owned by a bank, but we're really powered by right. a bank. So my cost of capital has gone from five or five and a half or whatever the securitizations now are three and a half to 0.25, right. the Fed window. Fed window, yeah. So it's a big difference, right? And so the first thing we did, well, let me back up for a second. So that deal closed February 1, 2021. It was six months of hardcore diligence. They already had the financial diligence and they already had three quarters of a billion of performing paper right. from us. So they already knew what we were doing. It's really getting in all the lawyers to make sure that the T's are crossed and the I's are dotted and, and that you do fully understand what it is that you're bringing under your banner. So once we got through that, we are set up as a wholly owned subsidiary powered by the bank. Um, I report to the board. Um, our HR and their head of HR have a, a dotted line. Mm -hmm. Our head of IT security dotted line. Right. Everything else is the same. We, we kept every single employee. Right. Didn't take any of the bank employees. Mm -hmm. And we've, since February, added like, what, 50 people to our organization? 50 new people. And I'd say they have eliminated a lot of potential red tape that we had in, in rolling out new states and programs. I think we've we've strapped a jetpack onto this thing. Oh, yeah. And, and I think we've rolled out more states in the last six months than we have, or since the acquisition, but than we ever have as an organization. It's kind of confusing to, from a, from a market watcher like myself, because I used to work at a bank, right? Mm -hmm. I used to work at, actually, we used to compete on loans with PacWestern. I work, I work for what is now Bank of Hope. Mm -hmm. And I remember competing with them and them being a very, like, you know, relatively aggressive commercial lender. Yep, right. They did a lot of commercial. They did a lot of loans that we did at the bank. And then I go to law school. I joined the space. And I hear that they're buying you guys. And I was just kind of like, this is not a normal play. You never hear this happen. That's like, right. You've heard of Goldman buying, you know, when Genesis was sold. You heard about, you heard Red about Red. MFA. You heard about Redwood. These are all Wall Street companies. Yeah. This is probably the first time a, a regional, what I call retail bank, an actual retail depository bank, in buying outright for a premium too, a private lender. And you guys kind of set the mark. And but the what what I am so fascinated about is nothing's changed. Like you guys still have, with Jetpack, right? But culturally, you guys are still oh, the yeah. same way. It seems. As a matter of fact, marketing wise, they've picked up a lot of things from us, and they'll tell you like. Banks have a different makeup. You know that have oh, being from one. Yeah. It's, 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 it's maybe more older school, more stodgy, more regimented. Hierarchies like, oh yeah. And like, like with us, it, it, it's exactly the opposite. And so one of the things I've appreciated about PacWest is they haven't gotten in their own way. If there is a best practice, they use the same swipe and adopt method that we built Civic on. And, and there's no pride of authorship. I don't. Right. I don't need you to tell me that that was my idea. If it works, let's do it, right? right? And we've seen that with them. What what I would tell you is this. I went in with eight eyes wide open. Mm -hmm. I've been in lending too long to know that it, it, it on paper it looked too good to be true. And and the CEO and and the gentleman who I work with over there, the EVP of of strategy, said all the right things. But. Yeah. When the tires hit the road, what's going to happen? What is I can this isn't a normal transaction. It isn't. But I, I'm I'm telling you, as I sit here, I've had zero surprise days. There's been some things. So so maybe inside of compliance, we have to train our people with certain lessons learned under a bank that we wouldn't normally train. Right. 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 Um, but as far as lending is concerned, nothing's changed. And when you talk about exceptions, like we. There's not a lot of companies that'll lend SFR to 10 million. We just closed a deal for 15 million in, in Bel Air. And the credit committee is me, the head of our operations, and four people from there. And you present the deal the way that you would present it to me. And there might be a couple questions, and it's a approve, 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 approve. We haven't had one deal that we've presented that has been kicked back because the bank's not comfortable. But that it. probably also is a credit to the previous relationship you built over the years. I think that's fair, the yeah. They For sure. The credit. They're comfortable with the credit box, comfortable with your risk now. At the end of the day, I think 
where we stand with them right now, they, it's not, it doesn't feel like they're bankers. They feel like they're business people, right? That's that are the in the business part. to do common sense Unheard type of. of lending. It Unheard. really is. Yeah. And 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 I and I it, it raised a lot of eyebrows and questions in the space because, like you said, is it now a bank? Are you now a bank? But like, I was like, okay, they're probably going to prove everyone wrong over the next few months. And you guys have, right? You know, since it's been announced. Because I've been on fire and growing, and now this even in 2021. Now, what's the numbers for the year so far? We're only in August. So, so, so check this out. We closed in February. Yeah. We we go four straight months over 140 million, and then two months over 155 million. And 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 remember, buying no loans. Right. Not doing any non QM. Right. No conventional. This is straight BPL. Right. So, like, I've seen a lot of crazy numbers from some of the competitors, and I applaud them, but. When you start aggregating, oh yeah, we bought fifty million. Right. Or it, it, it is different. We are belly to belly with our customers, right. transacting and adding. And when you do, it's like we're, we're going to cross a billion seven this year. A billion Impossible. seven. And let, and let me tell you something. We have five other products we haven't rolled out yet right. that will 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 dominate parts of the marketplace, and we only haven't rolled them out because we don't want to break operations. And I have two hundred and forty people in operations, and I'll break it when we roll some of these other products out. So we are just desperately hiring, desperately trying to improve efficiencies through tech, desperately trying to improve efficiencies through appraisal, which we just rolled out an eval product, which is unbelievable. Um, so like, I'm not worried about the volume. The volume's there. And if anyone wants to get into the pricing game thing, right. you know, there's a lot of meat on the bone. I'd prefer not to, because that's what makes a company's engine run. But we can't. Right. And so if guys want to, you know, roll around in the mud and get skinny, we, we we can do that. But that's a nice plug. We are hiring. Yeah. Right. Anyone I mean, listening? And all, yeah. and, and all, and all, and, and all, all departments. departments. Yeah. And that's the crazy part. It's like the level of activity you guys have put. I know you guys have been hiring been on a hiring tear. And this is a good transition on the hiring part. And I want to talk about the companies. We talk about the growth from a capital standpoint mm-hmm. and the horsepower that's been brought by the bank and by Bill and but the question now becomes: You guys are you guys are massive now. I mean, like we're, we're talking about from you said was it ten employees back when they found it? I think forty when 40, I came. Forty, I mean, no, 40 when you came on board. It started with yeah, five, four of us in the conference room, yep. right? And we're able to scale. Um, and now, how many employees? Just under uh, three hundred and seventy. Three hundred like plus, that. almost four hundred yep. in a matter of seven years. Mm-hmm. And granted, you guys had you know institutional partners, but a lot of our clients now do. But four hundred employees, right? And they're not all here in California. They're everywhere, right? We have, I, I'm friends with some of you guys as originators. I know some of them in Miami. I know some of them in Texas. It, the, you guys are across the nation now from an employee standpoint. And headquarters are in Redondo Beach. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But, I mean, managing a company of that size in a space that is hyper, what I would call aggressive when it comes to hiring, right? Mm-hmm. People transition spaces all the time. Sure. We, we see guys lateral all the time in yeah. this space, right? Yeah. How do you? How have you guys built it? What 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 have you guys used? You know, from a cultural standpoint, from a retention standpoint, from a training standpoint, to build because it is very hard to manage that many employees in in, in the, today's day and age, right? You, we see companies with the same numbers, but they have a very very lean team, and they are refusing to scale their the, the headcount, right? Yeah. For fear of culture, for fear of losing whatever value they establish with their employees, and frankly, also out of fear of lateraling, right? Because an overhead, right? And it's a, it's a fear from their perspective. Talk about that real quick, because I know you guys are very big on culture. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I've spoken with some of your employees, and they all tell, tell them like how awesome it is to work for you guys. I saw that thing you guys did. Uh, you guys gave away a car? At a, at, yeah. Like, I saw it. Was, a Tesla. It was a Tesla. Yeah, exactly. Like, you guys had this big party, like, where everyone converged. The, na- the entire country, mm-hmm. all your employees, all the country converged. Yeah, it was our, it was our uh, big sales event, right, in February. Of, Not just, just sales. Because, yeah, our the sales and ops. Yeah. It was our whole company event. It's, it's, and then it's, you guys give away a car. I mean, Well, <laughs> we didn't give away a car at that event. What we did is we had a whole karma, a gamification, where when people do good things for the community right. and for one another and – and hit certain milestones, we, they would earn points, and the top 10 point getters at the end, we would have a drawing for oh, a bunch so of things. Oh, tied to incentivization. Well, we just yeah. want people to treat others well. Right. And you know, there, I, I learned a long time ago, if I asked everyone in this room, let's uh, tom- we're gonna start wearing pink shirts, right? And and people are like, I, I, I don't wanna wear a pink shirt. I'm not wearing a pink shirt, I hate pink. Doesn't make my eyes look good. No, I don't look good in pink. Oh, maybe I'll wear pink. I'll if wear I said, I'll give you $500, Every day to wear pink, everyone would wear pink right. every single day. Right. So it's finding that kind of what is the motivator to get people to do good things in the company's right. name. 
And so this was it. And we actually just gave the car away um, a couple months ago, right? It was super exciting. So 10 finalists, we did a kind of reverse right. ball in like the NBA type of drawing thing, 9876. And the gal who won it um, was unbelievable. So well, actually all, all 10 of them really deserved it. It's, what I realized after we gave the car away was I wish we had thought this thing through a little bit better and everyone could have won something comparable right. because to win a $500 gift certificate and watch someone drive out in a $50,000 Tesla, you don't feel like a winner. Right. <laughs> and I just, that, that kind of bugged me a little right. bit, but yeah, we but, did. I mean, but this is a reward though for, for you guys have some kind of like a, what I would call recognition program for your employees. Right. right. And, and this is part of, we do this here with our employees with badges and we give smaller and we can't give away a car, but like the idea of, in, of rewarding and appreciating your employees goes to a lot about culture. We spend a lot of time on this show talking about culture of a company because I feel like the companies that have been successful in general, right, have, amazing cultures, right? They have good retention, they have, their employees want to come to work and they respect the CEO and they respect the board and they, they know that we're, they're rolling in the same direction. Yep. How are you guys, how have you guys built it? It's been around seven years now, yeah. it's now a short time. Well, I can you know? tell you, I think it's a culture by design, right? Okay. It, this didn't just happen. Yes, I think early days when we were a startup, right? right? And we still try to retain a, a startup culture, but you know, when we were a startup, we never lost that feeling of, of looking after each other. And I know when I walk into the office every morning, I have every single person's back and they have mine. Um, I think we've been able to retain that, that culture. And I think we, we live by our core values that we have each and every day. As a common thread on the show is every company that's, we talk about culture mm -hmm. that has taken this seriously has their core value. We have core values at the law firm. Can you tell us about your core values? Yeah, I mean, we have them posted on our coin. So every single this is one of cool. our, what it, Okay, so I've seen all types of uh, means of, 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 of uh, demonstrating values or appreciating employees. This is the first time I've seen, this is a military thing, right? This is. A, I, I think they're called challenge coins? They are. Yep, goes you, back. You wanna give the background? Yeah, so uh, uh, this, well, going all the way back, it goes back uh, a number of wars where they had these challenge, they had these coins really for an identifier of one another. And then it kind of built into something bigger. My brother, Special Forces, uh, had a number of coins uh, as he served our country those 20 years. And so I was brought into that a long time ago, really late 80s, early 90s. And as we went through in establishing our core values, and it was a 16-month process, and it was in closed doors yeah. with professionals from the outside that helped us work through the way that we thought about our business right. and one another. And I, and I will tell you, there were moments in there that we would walk out and there would be ill feelings towards one another because he might be passionate about one thing and I might not think that that translates or vice versa. Right. And we had a, the amount of time, energy and resources we came, we put in to come up with our top five core values that we believed was gonna drive this company through whatever it faced. And in this particular case, it was COVID, yeah. which you, you really do need your core values in a time like that. Uh, we went through and so we ended up with five. Uh, it was act with honor, be a great partner, communicate, clearly create smiles and simplify. So those are our five. And, and what I will tell you is each day in every way, when you have a challenge and it's before you and you really are not sure about turning left or right, and there's plenty of those. Right. If you let your coin or our core values guide you, you'll always find the right answers. If you act with honor, you could never really make a knucklehead decision. Right. It might not have been the best decision, but you didn't trample over somebody's grave to make it. And I right. think it's helped us a lot. It really helped us a lot when we had to think about people working from home. Because quite frankly, oh, I, I, we lost a lot of I mean, cultural appreciation and value when we went remote. It was hard. You it can't, hard. it's so hard to, reinst uh, to con continuously instill those values when you're on a Zoom call. It's just so hard. I mean, how do you, how'd you guys do it? Well, uh, what I would tell, I think I like what Witt said about by design. We have 14 full-time people that work in, in people and culture. And their sole responsibility. Wait, these are these are HR people. These are just just culture people and culture. And their sole responsibility is the health and well-being of our people. Wow. We do keep stop starts every quarter, mm -hmm. so everyone in our company gets to tell us what we should keep doing, what we should stop doing, and what we should start. Is that doing. anonymous? Absolutely. Yeah, it can it, be, it can or, be can or it doesn't have to it. be. Either I mean, way, ultimately, that and a lot of other things that we've done and, and process we've gone through come from the teachings of John D. Rockefeller. Right. right. So Rockefeller scaling up. I watched the I watched the interview of, of of you, Bill, and you had the scaling up book on your on your desk. I'm yeah. guessing you, you're. It, we we've studied it. We we did the map program. We did the gazelles program. Gazelles. Yep. Yeah, and we 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 adopted a similar thing. But the the challenge that we ran into during COVID was 
we went full remote. Like, probably two people were here. I'm guessing you guys probably had a handful of people at your office. Yeah, we were 85, 85 to 90% in the, right. in the belly of the beast right. working from home. Right. And so, and you guys are national, too, so you guys have employees all over the country. Like, how are you getting engagement from your people when all you can do is interact via Zoom? Well, one of the things you said, like, if you've gone through scaling up, one of the key parts is the huddles. So our morning huddles, we start first. Yeah. We have a 14 in our senior executive team. Right. We get on every single morning at 8.15. Every morning. Every morning. Every morning. morning. Through COVID, not COVID, every morning. And if he's traveling, he gives his information to one of his other mm-hmm. cohorts that are going to be on there. We go, word of the day, top three things that we're working on that day, anything we're stuck on, and an announcement. We go through that whole thing in 20 minutes, mm-hmm. no matter what. Then all of those around the table have their own huddle. That they will go oh, through you're the, the direct report. The By 10 o'clock, it goes through the entire organization from the secretary at the front desk to my desk and everyone in between. And the important part about that is if somebody's hurting, especially in COVID, somebody's hurting health wise, right. financially, emotionally, whatever it is, we're we're finding that out. I'm stuck. Why are you stuck? Uh, Wit um, sister has not been feeling well for some period of time. Parents got to come out. He, like we surround that situation right. and solve it because the more wit has to worry about that himself, the less connected he's going to be to the company. And so we, I mean, it, it, what has happened is it's just been this giant pinwheel of support and solving one another's problems and concerns and, right. and really being there. And, and let me tell you something, we've gone through some really tough emotional times when you have that many employees, people have stuff that shows up. And I think the emotional thing that COVID has brought to the families has probably been the most overlooked. Right. We talk about hospitalizations and people who get COVID and right. financially it hasn't been easy for some, but emotionally, I mean, they've had kids at home. They've had, you know, parents that have had to be watched over at home. They've been sick. They've yeah. Had economics. It's a lot just, of folks near psychotic breaks. I mean, you're just, you're just constantly being barraged by something. I think, I think what you would find out if you talk to our people is it's like, you know, you could have lip service and talk about the coin or you could actually live it out every right. day. And, um, you know, you, we didn't bring these coins because we were talking to you. Uh, I, I could see Wit on the beach hanging out on a Sunday. And if I pull this out of my shorts, he's got his coin. Anywhere mm. you go, any of our employees, 98 out of 100, some might forget right. it, will have their coin with them. How do you guys build that level of adoption across a country company that big? Because that's something like, I, I cannot, I'm, I'm a forgetful person. I might leave that on my desk somewhere. Or like I, You're not always thinking about this, right? Yeah. Values and, and doing living by these values at work, but also in, in your day-to-day life, right? And so how are you? How well, you are get you coined one time and you yeah. don't have it, and that'll oh, be enough. Okay. So the challenge coin, you want to what, what the, that means? Yeah, the essence of it in special forces is if you, well, they walked into a bar and you got a bunch of SFs there yeah. and somebody puts a coin down, right. if any one of those SFs don't have the coin, they buy everybody in the bar a drink. Oh, okay. And if everyone has the coin, the person who coined them would have to buy the drink. Now, obviously, HR doesn't want me running around making alcoholics <laughs> out of everyone, but I think it's really more of an acknowledgement. Like, right. hey, yeah. like, I got you, you got me, you got your coin, hey. We're, you know, we wear the same jersey. Right, and right. if you don't, you, I don't have to make you feel bad. You already feel bad that you kind of let the team you down. You establish kind of a vibe about it, a yes. cultural kind of establishment. Like, we're, we're going to carry this thing. Yeah. We're going to commit to carrying this thing. But it's thing not out. a shame thing. Like, I'm, I'm going to be shamed if I don't have it. It's more of a pride thing that you do have. Absolutely. Right? right. And so right. when I wake up in the morning and I, I get my way to work, I phone, keys, wallet, coin. Right. Like, I don't 100%. leave home without it because this is a I that's feel at, at empty top, without right? it. Everyone's yeah. doing it. And listen, some of the gals that don't have pockets, what they did is they got lanyards right. and they wear the lanyards and they put their coin in the nice. lanyards because, you know, everyone at one time or another has probably been coined and oh, well, it's right there on my desk. It's not on your body. Right. right there on your desk is not like with you. It's got to be part of you because we're together on this. And so that whole esprit de corps thing, I think, just yeah. comes through at our level all the way down. If right. we didn't take it serious, I don't think anybody exactly. else would. Right. But... Um, and are you guys so talking about this level of fellowship, right? We, I call this fellowship when it comes to like organizational fellowship and really having that level of camaraderie. But now you've got someone in Florida mm-hmm. on a Zoom call. You've never actually physically met this person before, right? Like, are you calling them over Zoom? One hundred percent. And if somebody Absolutely. if somebody isn't going like this, if somebody yeah. kind of reaches over like that, 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 that ah, come back, Joey, come back, Joey. Yeah. So like we used to have new hire dinners. We'd all go, and everyone had already got their coin, and there would be that moment. Right. Now it's it it is by call because people are all over the United right. States, and uh, and it, it, listen, it works. I, what I will tell you is, um, I always invite anyone to come over to our office, unannounced, uninvited, and sit in a corner and watch for yourself. Like 
there, it isn't like you're an originator and I am and we're against each other. It's like, how do you help that person right there that might be struggling on a call, might be struggling with guidelines, might be struggling in his marketing. Like there is a camaraderie that's different. I'm just telling you, it, it is different. And and listen, like I know like a hot topic in our industry is these non-competes and you can't go here and you can't go there. We don't have a non-compete in our agreement. Now, you can't leave and take employee contacts and stuff. But like if somebody leaves our company, the right. very first thing I do is I bring our guys together and go, what did we do? And I, I want to ask about that. So as a company that large, with that many employees, turnover is a natural thing. It yep. happens. And, you know, you guys have been, you know, awarded on, I think it was like an employer website online, like I think it's Glassdoor, like four or five stars. But naturally a company of your size also has people leave. Mm -hmm. People join, they leave, and that ha kind of happens. Yep. You know, like what's your process when it comes to someone leaves? Yep. And they, you know, they, for whatever reason, they can be an executive, it can be a new hire, lower, you know, new, a new, en new entry. What's your process when it comes to Yeah, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll take yeah, that. I'm, this, I'm very passionate yeah. about this one. So I, I think you treat people as good or better on their way out than you did on their way in. And so what Wit will tell you is like, if you're an originator, every single deal that is in the pipeline will be assigned to a manager and you will be paid what you should have been paid on that deal, regardless of how long it takes to close. Mm. If you're in operations and you're leaving for some other reason than going to a, another company, I'll help you find another job. I, I have contacts three and a half decades of contacts. If you're going to a competitor, I, I'm, I'm okay with that. Right. What I'm not okay with and, when, and where I can get my hair up is if, if you do something that's damaging to the company, you take something from the company, you, you take employee lists, you like that kind of stuff. Is, is, yeah, well, like like Act literally, yeah. And, and, and otherwise, no problem. Like, I've, you know, listen, we've bumped up. People have left companies and come to us and company people have left us and gone to some of our competitors. I'm like totally good with that. Just treat them the way that you treated them on the way in, plus a little bit, and you would expect the same reciprocation from that person who's going elsewhere. It doesn't always work that way. Of course. You've had some you know, knuckleheads that have done some um, non-act with honor things on their way out, and so I'll, pr I'll protect our company when it comes to that. But other than that, you, you won't find anybody... Anybody, it's never happened. Never ha happened with me in 35 years right. to enforce a non-compete. So I'm going to tell you, you can't go make a living right. for your family. Like I don't believe in that right. at all. And 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 what's interesting is like this whole people-centric concept in management and, and uh, like organizational management. It's, it's been a common thread you see in a lot of companies that have scaled up mm -hmm. over the years, and they've taken the Rockefeller habits seriously. But then you also have this kind of like super aggressive kind of Wall Street themed vibe in the space as well, right? And it, I think it primarily comes from East Coast operations. You know, we see a lot in New York and you see a lot of it infused, right? Because of the aggressiveness of our space, right? It's growing, it's becoming very aggressive. How are you, what are you guys doing to combat that kind of stuff, right? Because it's so hard, right? It's easy to be aggressive and competitive and hardcore about that kind of stuff and forget about people, you know? And especially as you're scaling, you know? I just, I don't think that's in our, our nature and our culture at all. I think we, we've, we've built it a little bit differently. I don't think we'll, we'll fall into that category because we are people first, right? We want to treat all of our people fairly. Right. And, and, and the people really are defined in a waterfall effect. It's not just your employees, it's your vendors, it's your customers, it's your referral sources, it's your third party ancillary services. It's, right. it's really everyone. We, we were on a call yesterday. Uh, one of our top producers said, would you get on a call, meet a potential big investor? We've done some deals, but he's got a whole bunch. And this investor got on and we did all the niceties and talked about and, and, and asked a lot of questions. Tell me about your business. The guy was just so darn rude. Yeah. Like I can and this is what and I yeah. expect. And, 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 and he talked about a relationship he had with another lender that was excellent. Mm -hmm. Yet here he is with me looking at throwing that relationship away for a tick here or a tick there. And it just... Uh, when I hung up the phone, I said, yeah, like, I'm not, in, like, I didn't tell that gentleman that, but I told the uh, account executive, I said, I'm not, I'm not interested in putting horsepower behind a guy that will leave his lender who's doing a stand-up job over a tick on his fee or his, right. like, it's just, I'm not in that. And so we get to, we're in a position right now where we do get to choose who we do business with. And so the, when you run up against some of those guys on a competition, I think you, you know, the consistency, quality, quantity, consistency. Just like those that said, hey, they're run by a bank. They're not going to do any loans. I said, you know what? The market will tell right. everyone whether we're doing loans or not. And, and I think it's the same way with people. 
Um, we might not win every deal. There might be some people out there that are so aggressive that they overpowered maybe a soft sell. We have some aggressive people in our staff too, but they treat people with respect. Right. I mean, I think yeah, at the end of the day, I think we're going to, we're going to be competitive out there, right? We're going to aggressively yeah. attack the no market slouches. and nothing like that, but, but I you're going to be telling them that they want to work with you. Yeah, exactly. I think from an internal kind of cultural perspective, I think we just, we emanate this feeling of just respect that right. we, we pass on to our partners. And really it isn't about rates and fees. I know everyone has to have good rates and fees, but we have a we have almost 20 people in our marketing department. If you were our customer, we'd put our whole marketing team behind you so you could sell your product better, right. so you could market your house better. We have a almost 30 people in our IT department. If you want to work on your website, we'll help you with your website. We have relationships with Home Depot and Lowe's that are different than everyone. We pass those discounts out. So it's not just rate and fee. It's like, how do we make you better in all these areas we've invested in? And that way, it's a it's a real, like for me, I don't look for the cheapest. I look for the best relationship. Right. And I'll pay a little more because I appreciate this, you right. and me. And so I kind of, I think we take that same approach with our customers now. And it, it, so far, it's it's been and working. And that's also a common thread on this show. We, we've, most of the folks that we've spoken with that have had success, not just from an origination standpoint, but from, you know, scaling their business. It's that, right? It's the, the idea of, like, we might not be the cheapest, but you're going to really like working with us. Yeah. You're going to really enjoy working with us, and you're going to stick around, and we're going to be doing millions and millions of deals together. Yeah. For... If you think about cheapest, like just let's just take yeah. let's scale this whole thing back. If you talk about cheapest, you could you could basically wipe out account executives and wipe out a big portion of, and then whoever gets the cheapest cost of capital, they advertise the most, and you have a fulfillment center. That's not what we're talking about. We're here. seeing that. Well, you've seen it a little bit, yeah, but yeah, like I don't think it. we've seen some price wars on the rental stuff. Yeah. Like some of these guys are out there with rental prices. It's when you look at the securitization, aggressive. well, you know, they also have to do it in a way that's sustainable. I know what those deals are training trading at on uh, through a securitization and what they're offering the market, and the the spread is very very tight. Even yeah. with origination points after incentive comp and all that, there's not a lot of meat on the bone. So. I don't know who wants to run a business doing hundred million dollars a month and barely squeaking out a profit. Oh That's goodness. not a good business. Yeah, those margins are paper thin. It, when it, it comes it, to it's amazing. I mean, it and is. it's getting more and more aggressive. When it first started, it was at rates that I thought were within reason for, for rental, right? And then, and then all of a sudden, it could cut in half in a matter of like a year and a half. Yep. Just, who's buying this stuff? And, and, and this is a good transition point. I want to talk about market conditions because I've always talked about this, you know, on the panels that I do and the, on the show. And stuff like that. we've been, we've seen a race to the bottom in this space, both both on fix and flip, but also we're seeing the same result on DSCR. It's like the level the level of risk that people are willing to take now, leverage is going up and up and up. I mean, I'm starting to see advertisements for 90 plus L. You know, no, really. cost. no one's lived through the financial crisis. I can guarantee thirty years of experience yeah. in the space, yeah, right? It's like, and so, and I want you to kind of like take a. You have thirty years of mortgage experience, and our industry is so interesting because it's it's in it's still in its infancy. I feel like it's it was it's still immensely fractured. Mm -hmm. You guys have been in the space for seven years now. <clears throat> We've been in it for roughly 10, 11 now, and you know. It's evolved over the years. Some folks say it's becoming immensely standardized and becoming like the conventional space. Only, I mean, as a person who's seen the conventional space become standardized over the years, because it, it, it's it's remarkable. It, even now, I look at it now, and when I was a banker, it's so different. The space looks so different, and yep. but we're, I'm starting to see shades of it in our space. We're starting to see, you know, like um, you know, really, really large organizations come in and have, you know take kind of UWM approach and like all they're doing is focusing on securitization and they're, all they're doing is focusing on price and risk and just, just that call center approach. And it's kind of, it's kind of frightening from a person who, you know, from we started out when the industry was and it's, you know, crawling out of the, the ooze. True you know, private. It was a hundred percent private. There were no institutional investors. Everything was funded by high net worth investors. And I'm I've been lucky enough to follow the, the ride and see its ev evolution. But I don't have thirty years of mortgage experience. Talk about. I mean, I mean, it's so different, you know. So yeah, yeah, I think if you don't learn from your mistakes, you're damned to repeat them. And so most of those companies that you're referencing that are in there in the '90s, yeah. like that, they've never had a host of loans they've had to take back that could literally cripple a PL, right, or their balance sheet. So. Like we pass on those deals, and that's okay. I don't want to. I don't want to 
uh, wrestle in that pit. Mm -hmm. um, I think we're aggressive. I mean, we go to 80 and 100 on the rehab. I think that's aggressive enough. We, we have had a year and a half of HPA, so people have benefited from house, house pricing going up. And right. it looks like we'll get a little bit more of that. But when that market switches and prices go the other way, those guys that have 90s and people that may not have finished or completed their deals, people will walk. Right. There's no PGs on these smaller loan amounts. They're, they're not reporting to credit agencies. It's very, very easy for an LLC to just wipe their hands and say, we live to play another day. And the end owners of that paper will see a side of the business that they will not like. Right. And that also reminds me of the last crisis in the sense that they're hyper-reliant, hyper, right, especially right now, hyper-reliant on this just boom that we're seeing in yeah, value. Yeah, and I think that's a huge mistake. And you've yeah. seen it for 30 years now. so it's Huge mistake. You know, like we I, had other people have, give us their opinion on it. I want to hear yours on that. Like, Well, I, I think the market is strong right now for a bunch of reasons. Six million units under um, served right now. So that's probably a two or a three year. Rates are still at historic lows. Right. Um, I, I think there's lots of opportunity in real estate for appreciation over the next two to three years. Right. I don't think so much over the next five to 10 years. I think- right. It, it does have to correct itself. Like we were driving up here and we we saw for about six months, 20 to 30 offers, 10% over list price, no contingencies, all cash. Like people had to yeah. lay it all on the line to buy. You're not, you don't have 10 to 20. You might have two to three and it might be 5% over list. And oh, right, right now. Yeah, right, right now. now. Like you're seeing it. So it is cooling yeah. off. Well, well, not I would say cooling, but I would say cooling I would off. Because I, I, I live in Orange County and it's still like very popular, right? You can't, you still can't buy anything right now. Like you have to. There's go a lack of inventory. That too, but also like it's popular to live. Like people want to live in Orange County. Yeah. It's great, right? And there are pockets of LA that are like that too, right? And we've always been had a competitive market, but like I see this this phenomenon happen in parts that of California that shouldn't it shouldn't be happening. Like in parts of you know I I couldn't believe when I saw this. I saw this house that was a, a, basically a drug house, and it was it was being they were asking. They were, they got three hundred thousand over asking price, Whoa. all cash offer. This house was torn to, sh to shit. Like there was literally shit in the toilet. So like, like literally when you literally. say, <laughs> and they had like pulled all the co copper wire out of the wall. Like you you think of the worst possible house, it was it, right? And they actually advertised a little slice of hell, and that thing sold over three hundred thousand dollars over asking wow. price. And this is recent, right? And so, and a lot of us, a lot of us are t telling our clients like this 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 ride is not going to last forever. It, you have to prepare for it, right? Absolutely. And so like. What are what are you guys doing to install those types of like redundancies uh, and and you know using your experience to kind of educate our newer operators in the space to to really make sure that they're looking at this from a you know 20 30 year perspective. Well one of the things we always say is like you could be off on credit, you could be off on experience, you could be off on FICO. Don't be off on value. Get your value right. Don't get emotionally connected to what yesterday was and what tomorrow right. looks like. What what is the real value of that asset? You have to understand that. And you also have to understand very well uh, the timelines and durations of taking an asset back. And I think what makes Civic different, what really made it different early on, is really what your father and Jim did from an NPL standpoint. We, have a, we had a floor of attorneys. Mm -hmm. And when good people do bad things and a deal goes bad, every single loan we've ever sold would come back to us to have us do the asset management. Why? Because we were experts at it. So it's not emotional. We didn't get mad at you. We just filed what we had to file. And you're going to go bankrupt? We'll be in there. You're going to file divorce? We're going to be in there. You're going to have liens and encumbrances? We're going to be in there. Get the asset back, get it beautified, and get it but out. that's a key component. Be it able is. to manage assets. You, you have to. Absolutely. Be you able to. to manage assets. Be able to process a foreclosure. You Understand what that looks like. Because in the future, those loans may come back to you. You don't over leverage. Make sure you value the properties correctly and have a backup if it does go wrong. I, th I think that's very well said. Uh, th like if you go one, two, three, that's really what it is. And it, listen, um, you got to pay attention to what's going on in the marketplace, right? That's also a really weak condition. Like we, that happened in a way. Everyone was like, "Oh yeah, there were." There, we've interviewed a few people on the show who said that's a bad sign, right? If if rate if prices continue to go up for five years in a row, that's not a good thing. But if you recall, and, and I, I remember it like it was yesterday, what happened in 08 and 09 wasn't just an interest rate thing. What ended up happening is the Wall Street had such an appetite for loans. It went from conventional to a little bit of non-QM to a more- Just dog so shit. At the, so at the very end, even Washington Mutual had a 100% LTV, 100% LTV, non-owner, non-owner or second home to $2 million 
And then they put a coffee loan on it, which was a negative AM. And so, and then, and, and stated. So you have stated non owner 90 to 100% to 2 million. And, and, and people that didn't have solid jobs right. that weren't making real money were stating they make 20 grand a month yeah. and qualifying. And so, what ends up happening is when they have no skin in the game and prices then pull back, they look and they go, I'm 200 underwater. Yes, you know, wait. Wipe my hands of that there deal. Were, there was no standard of underwriting. That and then, it really, if you think about the legal standpoint, there were so many law firms that specialize in keeping people in their homes for a thousand dollars a month. I remember. That. So you could never get the asset back. The difference today, the difference today, at least in our space, is these aren't owner-occupied properties. So we have a lot more rights to that asset than you had before. A lot more rights. You have a lot more skin in the game. So they're either motivated to solve the problem, or you have room to solve it yourself. Right. And so like, and, and then the, the credit qualifier, let me tell you something, the loans we do today are 10 times better than the loans that were being done in 2008. 10 times better. Yeah, that is true. I mean, the quality of loan and the quality of underwriting, the standardization, the one thing that I feel like our space has benefited from standardization and commoditization is the standard of underwriting that's been installed. Wall Street un finally understood what, what, what underwriting meant, we're comfortable with this kind of a risk, and now kind of everyone's kind of similar, following suit to that, and some guys are not, and... Some guys are buying more dog shit than they should, and that's okay. But you know, that's but there's still a standard of underwriting. We're not doing like stuff like that we did back in the way. Right. But at the same time, there there are to me there are things that kind of head scratchers. You start seeing massive willingness when it comes to like, for example, a, a, a DSCR loan, right? Like it, the amount of leverage they're willing to go to, the amount of risk they're willing to take, the amount like on the DSCR. It just doesn't seem like a sustainable business to me. I mean, honestly, if, if, if we took this offline and we started talking about some of the firms, you would, and you looked at their P&Ls, they're, they're, they're just getting by. Yeah, and that's the, and that's the and scary that's, part. It is. But well, you some know, for, of them aren't even here anymore. That's right. As a result of the margin calls right. and everything that happened during COVID. And that's the fascinating part too, right? Since, oh, since COVID, there have been, there have been kind of new market, new players that jumped in because they, they missed the boat. Yeah. Like five years ago, like fifteen, when when everything kind of when Wall Street just like jumped in, right? They yeah. missed the boat then, and they jumped in during COVID, and they're doing well now. Yeah. But there's also that same kind of level of aggression we're seeing when it comes to risk. And I agree with you. I think that there's less risk to be had on these assets. But I I just I, I feel like there's still a lot of reliance on this hyper increase in valuation. I, so, I agree. I, you know, the way I think about it is it's sixty to seventy billion dollar a year space. If we do two billion of it. And we're trying to. That's a really th conservative number, actually. It's well, you know, billion. It gets a little bit bigger if you start throwing some multi, you know, yeah. long-term yeah, rental yeah, 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 rental yeah. builds. I'm talking about fix and flip and bridge and stuff. Mm. So when you start thinking about that, and we want to go from a billion seven to two and a half or three right. or five, you can be picky. Like you could say no a lot. There's there's a part of the market for those that want to take the risks, low margin, right. higher LTV or leverage. There's there, there's a part of the market where those three or four players can play right. and do fine. And take the risk, and that's their business model. That won't be ours. And and so this this is a good kind of like segue into we have, we're running out of time, but I want to have a final segue on like, well, first thing I want to ask you guys, we always ask this on the show. Right now, uh, looking forward for another two two three years, bullish bearish on fix and flip, fix and flip, because this is an interesting time for fix and flip. Right bull, now. yeah, like bull. I, I'm very very bullish on the market. Bullish on real. You said two to three years. Bullish, like. I think in, if you fast track two to three years, we're a three to four billion dollar a year firm. And you qualified it through three years, right? So you're, you're predicting a correction in about three years. I'm saying that I'm not smart enough to know past that period. I have enough information right now to know that if all the numbers that I've been reading are accurate, it will take that long to fulfill the housing needs. And, right. and listen, there's something else that's going on right now that we didn't talk about is people are leaving uh, the big areas of New York and California, they're going inward. Oh, mass they're going migration. To, uh, I mean, I'm listen, the great migration. Of, uh, it's it, crazy. It, really, like, they're, so we have 14% tax in California. People going to Arizona or yeah. Vegas or Nashville or uh, the Carolinas, uh, like, they're, they're, they're going from zero to 4%. It's an instant raise. Yeah. And the cost of living is, re I was in Texas four days ago. Gas was two sixty. I just drove by there. It was four seventy. Yeah, it's like two sixty a gallon. So, and also, so that's houses happening. are like five hundred thousand dollars, and you're living in a beautiful property. And why it works is we just proved that through COVID that people can get the job done from home. They can, they can get the job well, from with the, the right home. kind of culture and reminders. Yeah, right? Sure, sure. Like our experience has been, it has worked. And like for me. Like if, if Witt was happier at a different state and he could still bring in 
uh, the same sort of value add and, and, and offerings to Civic that he did, why wouldn't I support him 100% to take his family to a place that was better for him. Moving to Nashville? <laughs> uh, Charles, Charleston, Close. South Carolina. Oh, you are you are with me. He is. Doing it. I'm jealous. Yeah. I know literally every week I, I have a client in Austin. He's like, Kevin, look at this, look at this ranch. You can buy it for what you pay for your house. I'm like, yeah. you gotta be kidding but, I mean, me. that's really without getting personal, that's yeah. really his. He found an absolute beautiful, beautiful home on a beautiful piece of property that he couldn't have gotten this much in Manhattan oh, Beach. You, it's like trade a two bedroom, one bath into a, you know, a much larger home that we can yeah. grow a family in and That's be happy in for a long time That's my thing. without putting another dollar. So I think there's going to, and we've had that, like we've had leaders go to Texas. We've had leaders go to uh, Nashville. We've had leaders go to Vegas, Arizona. Yeah. And I think my position is support them, support them, support their family. Uh, it's a very unique time. Yeah. And, I also think by allowing that, you can bring some more talent on. Like if you were at a mortgage company that needed you here in Irvine yeah. and you wanted to live in Florida yeah. and we were open to that, you might consider joining us. So I think there's some opportunity there. Absolutely. I mean, you're going to see people who want that. I mean, you are seeing people want that flexibility. Yeah. You know, in our hiring, we're seeing that. They want to have more flexibility. I need to work from home twice a week. I'm kind of used to it. I kind of like it. Some folks insist on it. They, mm-hmm. Some folks say, hey, I live in... New York, I live in Florida, I want to work for you. Are you are you down? I'm like, absolutely, I don't care. We spent the last two months coming up with a thing called Civic Anywhere. Yeah. And it, it's off the heels of COVID. And so what where we are right now, we have about a third of our employees will pass COVID. Like if COVID's cured and it's yeah. in the rearview mirror, third of our employees will work full time at home. About a third of them will be hybrid, half and half, and a third of them will be in the offices. So, you know, less square footage on the big super offices we have, maybe more offices. In the Charleston, Nashville. That's great because yep. that establishes reach. That establishes a place for you to actually meet. Yep. The footprint is nice. To and entry into additional markets that I think are, are really tough to take hold in okay. until you have a physical presence. You need there. to be there. And that's There's a, some that's states a, where you have to be there. You have to be there. Yeah. Like the Midwest is an underserved market and you can't get anything done there without being yeah. there. So yeah. it's. And I think South Carolina, the Carolinas, as Carolinas, well. Texas. I think there's a general distrust of of people outside of the state. Yes. And so I have a ton of clients in Texas, and they do very well in Texas because of that. And yeah. being in the state makes a huge difference. Yeah. But ultimately, I think that that fix and flip product is going to continue. We're we're bullish on it because people are interested in housing stock elsewhere, right? Yeah. There's more housing markets people are looking at. Right. I think a lot of the people that are first time home buyers are looking for a, a turnkey product yeah. as well, and so. There's not a lot of people that want to take on a big renovation and project because they're first home. Yeah, on the investor side, the builder side, they're active still. They they are. Are. And, and that, so we are rolling out a ground up construction product fantastic. in fantastic. the very near future as well to help capture that marketplace fantastic. as well. Fantastic. So fantastic. we're excited about that. All right. Well, I think that's all the time we have for today. I uh, don't want to go too long. We want to keep you from work. We want to make sure to get you back to work. Uh, thank you once again for coming down to our offices here in Irvine. I know you have a long drive and I really appreciate it. We'll see you at the next show. Absolutely. We'll be there. Captivate. Hopefully we'll see you at a show. Yep. I'm gonna be right. there. He's coming. Uh, he's coming. He's coming. Right. Well, yeah. our audience will finally get to meet Bill at a, at a Jurassic show. Fantastic. And uh, this is all we have for here today. Thank you once again for joining us. Thanks and, for having uh, us. This will be our inaugural episode for season two. A Lender Lounge, look out for us at a show and get your hat at the show. All right, take care. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thanks for listening to Lender Lounge with Kevin Kim. I hope you enjoyed this episode as much as I did. If you did enjoy, please leave us a five-star review on your podcast platform and be sure to follow our show to be notified of new episodes. If you're on YouTube, don't forget to smash that like button and hit subscribe for more content from all of us here at Jirasi. Lender Lounge with Kevin Kim is available on all podcast platforms. Referrals really help us spread the word, so please send this over to someone you think might enjoy it. See you next time. This is Kevin Kim signing off.